welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcast, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Jamie Scott Okataya, and on behalf of my family here at JSA, welcome and thank you for tuning in to our JSA Virtual Roundtable, entitled Marketing Strategies Post-Pandemic, Top Trends and Tools for the Network Infrastructure Industry. All right, guys, a couple of housekeeping notes just before we kick it off. Our first 100 registrants for today's roundtable should by now have received lunch delivered to your door or a gift card. So go ahead and please enjoy. We have well over 200 registrations for today's roundtable. So if you weren't one of our first 100, hopefully next time, make sure you register early for our monthly roundtables at jsa.net. You know, I had to say that. All right. Um, also, this is all about being interactive and giving you a chance to be heard and to hear uh, from some great some great executives here. So we want to make sure that this uh, experience is as, you know, as, as uh, helpful to you as possible. So go ahead and ask any questions that you may have in the chat or request the mic to go ahead and come on camera and ask a question to our panelists. Also, stick around our roundtable. Once, uh, once it's finished today, we can join those virtual networking tables immediately following for a very unique opportunity to talk face-to-face -face with our event attendees and speakers. Simply just join the table in the lounge area and let the networking begin. So stick around. All right, let's get started. Our topic today is marketing strategies post-pandemic, top trends and tools for the network infrastructure industry. And it is a very timely, timely chat. We are in full fall mode. I can't believe already middle of September. Uh, it's funny, I was writing a letter today, uh, this morning to my clients and couldn't help to compare this time of the year to watching my 15 month old uh, who just learned how to walk. And so she's running, falling, running, falling. And I kind of feel like, yeah, that's this time of year. We are racing forward, wanting fast wins before end of year, while also trying to look forward, pace ourselves, plan out 2022. And there's still so many uncertainties, so many question marks from live event attendance to ever increasing privacy policies and eventually the death of third party cookies by Google. And, uh, you know, that's 2023, but we need 2022 to, to really move away from third party contacts to owning our audience more. And, and still there's this need for brands, particularly in our industry, to foster this trust, to personalize our, our messaging, to be viewed as thought leaders rising above the internet's white noise, to be heard, to connect, make a difference to our community, to our clients, our prospects, our employees, everyone basically remote, um, that, that beautiful face-to-face trust-building time. So it's a very unique time, not an easy feat for us as marketing planners. So to break this all down, please welcome our roundtable of experts to help us. Today, we are joined by John Falker, the Marketing Director of Prime Data Centers. Joanna Susi, Vice President of Brand Strategy over at Aligned. Corey Cohen, Vice President of Partner Experience. Oh, uh, actually, um, just three days on the job over at Intermedia, I almost said TBI. Uh, just a, a big change there for Corey. Um, Carrie Cunningham, Senior Principal, Product Marketing at Sixth Sense. And Eric Bell, founder of Baxtel. So let's go ahead, get a, go around the horn, set the stage a bit. Please go ahead and introduce yourself and your company, let's start with John. Hi everyone, thanks Jamie. John Falker, I lead marketing at Prime Data Centers. We are a wholesale data center developer and operator. Prior to Prime, I was doing a lot of software startups. I think five is, is my current total at the, at the moment. That's, uh, that's where I came from, happy to be here. Uh, we love that startup uh, person perspective for sure and very uh, critical considering our industry always uh, growing, changing M&As. Joanna. Thanks, Jamie. Joanna Susi. I'm the SVP of Brand Strategy over at Align Data Centers. We also are a data center um, operator, builder, um, serving the hyperscale and enterprise markets. Um, prior to Aligned, I was on the agency side, worked for iMiller Public Relations, um, and thanks for having me on. Our pleasure, Joanna and Corey. Turning myself off mute. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm Corey Cohen. I'm currently 
uh, Senior Director of Global Channel Marketing and Intermedia, which is a global cloud uh, communications and collaboration company. But I was previously, because I am four days on the job at Intermedia, I was previously Vice President of Marketing and Partner Experience at the Master Agent TBI. So I'm very excited to talk about this topic today. No, I'm excited to have you. Love the channel perspective as well. Uh, Terry. Thanks, great to be here. Um, I am with a company called Sixth Sense. We're a B2B marketing account engagement platform, but I'm on my sixth week. So a little longer in my job than Corey is in, in hers. I spent the last seven and a half years at uh, Serious Decisions and uh, then at Forrester, once Forrester acquired Serious Decisions as a vice president principal analyst in marketing operations and demand strategies. So really glad to be here today. Well, I love your perspective as an analyst. We're dealing with a lot of data these days as marketers. So uh, glad to have you. Thank you. And Eric. Hi, my name is Eric Bell. I'm with uh, Backstell. Um, I've spent 20 years in the network and data center space with a focus on interconnection. You know, currently run Backstell. It's a data center information platform or a neutral third party uh, that provides wealth of um, information and tools for those who are looking for data centers. Uh, and we have over 23,000 active users a month. I love it. Thank you, Eric, for joining us. And uh, a big shout out to to Backstell. Your your resource uh, website is is really uh, a wonderful addition for for our data center industry. So thank you. And uh, you know, leading up to today's chat, we uh, we went ahead and pulled our LinkedIn community, uh, asking which marketing tactic has been most important to your company in 2021 thus far. And the results are in. Uh, this morning, our final tally, 39% say virtual events, 14% digital marketing, and 23% on email and LinkedIn networking. And then there was a 25% that said combination of all of the above. All right, so let's kick it off with Corey. I'm gonna change it around here. Uh, does this, uh, do these metrics sound sound true to you? Is that what you've been seeing in house, both at TBI now at Intermedia? Um, so I mean, you know, it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, answer for sure. Where most people rated uh, virtual events as top priority, I think I don't know how that was worded. Um, we certainly did a lot of virtual events uh, this past year. And I would say that we were leaders in doing so, experimentation and a lot of fighting for attention. The problem is, though, is that uh, we're in like such an interesting dynamic, right? I'm working from home. I have a three and a four year old. I'm like taking them to doctor's appointments, running around for the first time ever. I'm like leaving my desk. I've never really done that before. Like um, I've just always been at the office. And so how do you buy for people's attention? Um, when everyone's so, you know, kind of burned out, but also just like doing life. Um, so I would say for us, you know, um, and now joining Intermedia, the biggest focus I would definitely say is digital marketing in all forms. Um, a lot of, a lot of search engine marketing, but also, um, but also social media as well. And I know that some of my other, uh, uh speakers are going to talk about that too. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and actually, uh, let's kick it over to Eric um, at Backsale. You're seeing social? Yeah. Um, so, we, you know, uh, we've historically fo really focused on SEO. Uh, and in the past, we've we've kind of not done as much social. And this year, we've um, upped our social game um, and, and provided a lot more emphasis on social. Yeah, absolutely. Critical piece of, of that digital um, assets uh, that, that uh, us marketers are, are managing these days. Uh, Joanna? Yeah, I think uh, I echo everyone's sentiment. I think we've done three or four virtual um, events. I think, um, I don't know, Jamie, I think before this, you called it the, the Zoomies. Is that what you said before? <laughs> uh, it's a little bit of webinar Zoom exhaustion that everyone's getting. So I think for us, um, and which will be a continuing factor in 22, is just finding out how to creatively bridge the gap between you know having needing that relationship building and that, you know, human interaction and not being able to probably in the future being able to, you know, meet with our customers and prospects face to face. Uh, it's certainly not what we're used to at all. Um, travel restrictions still, you know, 
maybe local, but not not uh, international like we used to. There's a lot of question marks for sure. Terry, um, what are you feeling? Yeah, I was a little surprised to see that uh, the top most important one was was uh, the virtual events. I think you know the answer probably has something to do with the fact that we had to get good at them really fast uh, and weren't necessarily before. So it was probably the most important thing to master that you hadn't mastered before as an organization. Um, I think still the uh, the all around digital marketing was, is for sure the most important thing that, that people can be doing well. And that virtual events are really now part of that. And I think are going to remain part of that. Uh, giving people a way to connect uh, is super important. I think that's one of the things that those things, those events do. Yeah, I think I think you're phrasing it well. It's digital marketing as this, as this massive bucket, virtual events, social, uh, email campaigns, uh, uh, much more actually falling under there. Uh, John, do you have anything to add, especially from the prime side? I mean, we we took an experimental approach to virtual events. We certainly participated as guests, like I'm doing in this one right now. We didn't host any major uh, virtual events on our own. We didn't sponsor any major virtual events on our own, unless it came, unless that sponsorship came as part of a larger sponsorship package. Uh, we we wanted to take a wait and see approach. I think that moving forward, as Kerry pointed out, you know, we've been working out the entire brand world has been working out the kinks on virtual events. And now that we're starting to iron it out, I think that we will take a much more serious look at a deeper engagement in virtual events next year. Yeah, I, I think you're right there. There's definitely a hesitation, uh, particularly in our marketplace. People were wondering, well, even if we you know, sponsor or, or register for this uh, virtual event, what's the attendance really going to look like? Uh, you know. Um, Corey said it best, just getting people's attention, uh, you know, very difficult. Uh, so, so how do people actually um, dedicate their time to, to showing up at a virtual event? And does that warrant our sponsorship dollars? Uh, it, it was definitely a, mm, I'll, I'll check this out and wait and see type of feeling in 2020 and, and uh, 2021. Uh, but, uh, you know, are we in it for the long haul a little bit? Is it, is it going to change in, in, in 20? 22 people feel more comfortable or, or put more emphasis on it because we just don't know when the next time we'll really have those meaningful live international events it's an interesting interesting question um, um john we'll stay with you there um do you think that in 2022 we'll be uh We'll be investing especially since tentative with 2021 for for events virtual events uh, do you see yourself really investing dollars to sponsoring a virtual event in 2022? We could. It's certainly on the table. Uh, we're entering a, a pretty aggressive growth phase as a company and a brand. And so generally speaking, the marketing strategy is to start to build awareness, uh, start to engage on a deeper level with our accounts, our most important accounts. We do take largely an account-based marketing approach, ABM approach. Yeah. Um, and you know, virtual events and in-person events will both have a large role to play in that strategy. And I, I would also note that we are, most of our business is US dominated at the moment, but we are looking next year to really move outside of the United States for the first time in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, events, both virtual and in-person, will play a role in that globalization of, of our brand as well. Yeah, that's really, it's really interesting. Um, as your strategy gets international, you know, the limits with travel and, you know, borders are, have become true borders now. Look at the crackdown between Canada and the U.S. It's, uh, you know, unprecedented as the word is uh, overly used there. But, um, Joanna, I'm curious, uh, over at Aligned, are, are you guys... Uh, thinking 2022 to actually sponsor virtual events? I think we'll continue sponsoring meaningful virtual events that we feel would have, you know, a big impact. I think we've also, and I, I know we've all, you know, experienced this. <laughs> we, we have kind of two strategies and maybe a mix thereof where we 
we have a strategy that makes it really easy to pivot. Um, and while we're all crossing our fingers and hoping that we can see each other, you know, in person and have a budget set for um, uh, in-person events, I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I think they, they will definitely have a seat at the table still going into 22. Yeah, well said, well said. And Corey, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like the channel uh, industry, they, they're they always up for a good in-person event. Like, I don't know, do, do, do channel partners not even take a break throughout this um, uh, pandemic? Yeah, we love our events. Um, you know, navigating this, uh, I, I definitely see us investing in smaller and hybrid events. I know that that's the... That's the buzzword right now, hybrid. How do you make that? How do you do like viewing parties and how do you make certain things interesting? Um, how do you still get ROI from some of these um, from some of these investments in in virtual? And frankly, it's hard. I mean, like I said, everyone's everyone's in the same boat. So we're all we're all trying to figure it out. Um and there's no magic button, I think, at this point that we can push, though I wish there were. I think for us, like I said, smaller, more intimate um, events, you know, um, are still going to happen in person. Yeah. And I think uh, John maybe said it best with like the ABM approach. I think that COVID has really forced the ABM approach um, in an interesting way where we're just like, you know, really targeting those partners and those uh, customers that um, we really need to stay in front of. And uh, I think that's what we're going to look to invest in and get creative on for this year. Yeah. And I know, Eric, you were thinking of attending some live events uh, come 2022. Is that still still on oh, yeah. the books? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're vaccinated and I know there, there's still issues with that. And But, you know, We'll, we'll we'll be attending some uh, events, maybe smaller events. Um, but I think also, um, you know, we, we started working with JSA this year, uh, and we'll you know, uh, and, and uh, as such, we we you know did some press releases, and I think we'll do some more next year. Um, and then as a, I'm also looking at what our unique capabilities are as an organization, and one of them is data. And so we'll utilize our database to come out with um, rankings and some other ways to track and measure the data, data center industry that might produce some publicity and, and attract users. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And actually, that leads nicely uh, over to Carrie. Um, data, data tracking is critical. Um, mm -hmm. You know, from just to conclude the the virtual events, are we spending money? Are we going to actual like 2022? Just to wrap the events on, uh, bow up here. Um, Gary, what are you seeing from from uh, Six Sense perspective? Yeah, both from uh, Six Sense and Forrester, uh, they're going to be uh, hybrid events, as Corey mentioned, and I think um, that's probably a, a really good model going forward. Uh, you can get a lot more people connected if you allow some of them to view and participate remotely. A lot of people are still going to want to uh, travel and go get together. I know that the Forrester slash Serious Decision Summit is something. It's a it's a it's a cultural event for B two B marketing and sales folks. It's not just uh, it's not just a trade show, right? It's where the community gathers uh, once a year, and I think people miss that. Um, when people still can't do it though, uh, now they'll be able to do that remotely. We're gonna do the same thing with our customer conference at Sixth Sense in a couple of months. We'll have uh, a live in-person gathering and for the folks that uh, are not uh, able to travel or able to attend for uh, one reason or another, there'll be these virtual events. Now that's another thing to figure out, right? So we figured out how to do a digital event, a uh, virtual event. Now you're gonna have to figure out how to do this hybrid thing. Um, but I think that's going to pay off. I think that's that is the hybrid thing is going to be a thing that's going to stick. I, I doubt that be all that many purely virtual uh, big events uh, going forward, but certainly a lot of the hybrid events. Okay, I, I think you more. I think hybrid is is here to stay. You know, just even taking a temperature check uh, internally here at JSA as a business owner, I'm, I'm, I'm being led by my employees' comfort levels. You know, uh, you know. Half of us are ready to, to run out there and, and start shaking some hands and, and seeing our old friends. And the other half, like myself, you know, we have little ones uh, at home and who, are, you know, can't be vaccinated yet. 
Uh, so traveling is, uh, you know, questionable, particularly to, to bring you home. Uh, you know, uh, how am I going to, to uh, stay away from my, my little one for, for two weeks? Uh, while quarantining, like it's, it's just tough. Um, so, yeah, I hear you. Hagrid is here to stay. So, um, guys, in the past year and a half, you know, so much has changed. How has your role changed? What are your most successful go to market strategies to date in this post pandemic reality? Uh, Corey? I knew you were going to throw this one to me first. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's funny. I always, I always joke that my, that my role is like therapist, mom, boss, and like in that order, um, with, with my people, like with my team. And I would say that's even more so the case, um, in the pandemic, um, you know, you said it best, Jamie, where you are led by the comfortability of your people. I too, um, have done the same thing this past year, which is like temperature check. Like, how are you feeling? Like, let's, let's take a step back and, um, not forget about the fact that like work is not everything, you know, um, your mental, uh, state of mind, um, your mental health is the most important. Um, if you're feeling good and if you are good, then you'll do good work. Uh, so for me, my role <clears throat> truly changed um, in that sense, right, where I was like even more ingrained, I think, in my team's life just because I was feeling not so good, um, especially in Chicago, where the weather sucks during the year, during the winter. Um, I was like, oh, this is just becoming too overwhelming um, and producing content on remote work and how to enable remote work and UCAS and CCAS and pumping this stuff out at an enormous rate. I mean, we were going like 18 hours a day. It was crazy. Um, I was like, this isn't okay. And it's okay to not be okay. So we had to take a step back and I think um, assess like personal life before work life. I'm so glad you brought this up. I, you know, I think us as marketers, are, you know, yes, of course, our marketing departments have to be in, in line with sales and in line with, you know, overall business objectives. But we also have to be in line with HR in a way. Like we are, we are often tasked with, um, you know, how are, how is everyone feeling and, and getting a sense of employee communications. Um, uh, you know, um, do you see that, Joanna? Is that, was that part of some of your role changing uh, in the past year and a half? Absolutely. And Corey, I hear you on Chicago being a, an interesting place in the wintertime. I, I myself am based in Chicago. But yes, uh, we, in addition to, you know, figuring out external marketing, we've had to do a lot of internal marketing, helping out HR, working alongside the team to, you know, communicate what we were doing from a safety, um, from a, a health perspective. You know, we are, um, um, much as John said, you know, on a, a growth path at this point, we're building a lot. We have a thousand people on site, you know, on average daily. How are we protecting those people, um, you know, day to day? Um, so all of that was a factor that, you know, was a new factor to us, I would say, um, um, this this past year and a half. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And. Uh, John, how about you? How, how are you feeling, Robert Prime? How has your role changed? Well, I would say the role really hasn't changed. Uh, Corey was exactly right that, that marketers are used to change. It's the only constant. <laughs> so, so the role is or should be built to adapt uh, day to day. The, the go-to-market strategies, um, yeah, they've, they've changed for all the reasons that everyone else has, has pointed out. Um, we're, we're trying to meet people where they are and we're trying to be empathetic because everyone is dealing with all kinds of stuff, whether you are um, being a parent of a little one at home. I have a five-year-old who just started kindergarten uh, or whether you are, you know, trying to manage personal issues, like trying to get out to see family members on the other side of the country or the other side of the world who um, you haven't been able to see in a long time. People are just juggling a lot more. And 
uh, trying to be empathetic as a brand, as a company, uh, as a marketer, I think is more important than ever. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I I hear you. I have a I have a pandemic baby that half of my family hasn't even seen yet, which is craziness. Um, and Eric, you know, as a as a fellow founder, uh, obviously uh, your your employee uh, health check ins are, are paramount as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the way Backstill does, we have a lot of um, contract folks that we work with, and so it's not direct employees, but you know, still checking in on them is important. I know from a personal perspective, um, you know, we were lucky enough to have an au pair uh, here at school uh, here, um, and so she really helped out a lot uh, at home with the schoolwork to allow me to focus on work uh, here. Yeah, that's so critical too. How are you building even your your own personal network of support so you can have work time uh, that doesn't lead into uh, personal responsibilities, family responsibilities. It's, it, you know, talking about uh, it takes a, takes a village. Um, it still, it still does, if, if not more so in this new digital reality. Um, hey, Carrie, what are you seeing? Yeah, so from from my perspective, it's a it's a little bit different because I'm actually more focused on or have been over the last eight years, more focused on other people's operations than the one I was part of. And so so seeing what a lot of other folks were doing. Um, one of the things that I think has worked really well. So if you think about what a marketing organization is trying to do, one of the most important things it's trying to do is establish the connection between your brand, your organization and the market in which you operate. And what is that uh, connection going to be? How how? Vibrant is that connection going to be? What's the flavor? What's the color of that uh, connection? And that all becomes much more challenging if you can't be out and around folks. Uh, so a lot of organizations, I think, have done a really good job of being more authentic and more present, even digitally and virtually. Um, I think because we're seeing everybody else at home now and we hear the dogs and we hear the kids and all of that, the walls come down a little bit between uh, between fellow employees and between employees and customers or prospects. You know, we kind of know each other a little bit better in some ways than we did before. Uh, we're not meeting in an office uh, somewhere. Instead, you know, I hear your parrot in the background. Uh, so now I know you have one uh, and it talks and it says things, you know, <laughs> that actually happened on the call, right? So I think that part's been really good. And the, and the folks that have been best able to adapt to that and just say, you know what, we're we want to be connected we want to feel connected and i'm just going to drop some of the pretense that we had before and actually connect with you as a prospect or customer as a human being i think that's worked really well yeah. and i hope we'll continue that yeah i feel like our profiles are probably a lot more uh colorful now when we're typing into our content management system uh, joe has a parrot <laughs> When somebody, come, when somebody comes blasting through your virtual background and to whisper over your shoulder that they need something, you know, those kinds of things. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, I'm going to stick with you for my next question because I think it's a great transition. What do you see as the greatest marketing and or business challenges now that we're, we're in this new reality? Well, I think, you know, the... the, the Biggest challenge is the biggest opportunity. It's nice when those two things align, but one of the things that organizations uh, have realized over the last year, started to do a lot better job of, is to make use of the investment that you've already made in uh, marketing. So I would say, and did say for a lot, for seven or so years at, at Forrester, that most organizations uh, make a very poor use of the investment that they make in bringing people to their website, and getting them to fill out forms or getting them to their events. The vast majority of web traffic is anonymous and nobody knows who's there. Um, if you're most B2B brands, most of the brands in this space, no disrespect to you, but there's nobody coming to your website by accident, right? They're there on purpose. Now that doesn't mean they're all potential customers, but you should not ignore and you cannot ignore that. You need to know where that traffic's coming from. The privacy laws don't interfere with you being able to understand what companies they're coming from. So that's been important. We've seen a lot of organizations, I think the leading, leading organizations who've gotten through this period well, start to really focus on that. Like you've already spent the money to get these people to your website, understand where they're coming from. Second thing is 
if you've got a thousand people who filled out a form, probably only a hundred of those or something like that became your MQLs and got sent over to sales or something. Those other 900 filled out forms and they're probably not junk and they're probably also related to the hundred who did become MQLs. You have to know if you're a marketer and you don't know the answer to the question, how many of my leads came as groups or teams, then you're missing a big part of the picture. So we've seen a lot of organizations get much better at that, but the awareness of that and the ability to go solve for that uh, is, I think, the thing that's going to get us to the next level of performance. It's not just like a small incremental change. It's like you have paid for a lot of eyeballs and a lot of traffic and you're not doing anything with it. Right. So fix that and you'll be better off going forward. Data tracking makes me want to bring in Eric. <laughs> Here what I am. Here uh, I am. Uh, un unmuting myself. So, um, you know, we don't have a, a direct sales team. Instead, we've built a lot of tools to be self service. And it's not a surprise that, you know, Build It and They Come, Build It and They Will Come hasn't produced the highest results. Um, and we started working with JSA uh, to help, you know, promotion uh, and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, from that perspective, JSA has really encouraged us and, and I'm a data guy uh, and we have a lot of data. But in terms of visitors to our website, uh, what Carrie was talking about, you know, we are we're starting to collect that information and we're, we're looking at ways to enhance it. Uh, and really provide a lot of, you know, build an analytics platform uh, beyond just the, the standard analytics platforms to really understand that traffic. Yeah, I think it's critical. Uh, our, our, you know, how are our contacts finding us? What do they want from us? Are we being responsive? Uh, John, how are you guys doing it at Prime? Well, I think just being smart, I agree with Eric, definitely, that a lot of a lot of this is is just being more committed to what you know works and what what you've known for years that you need to be doing well and the correct priorities and order of operations in marketing. Uh, I try to always adhere to the marketing order of operations, which is when I think about the media universe, I do owned first, then earned second and paid last. And I uh, only do paid after I'm very comfortable with the state of sophistication that my owned media and my earned media is in. Uh, so I think just coming back to those first principles is the, the healthiest marketing strategy and behavior. I couldn't agree more. And yet, you know, you're watching ad rates, digital ads, you know, are, are so expensive these days uh, for the same keywords that, uh, you know, five months ago, uh, you know, we're talking pennies on the dollar. So, um, Joanna, what are you seeing over at, at Aligned? I, I think broadly, um, as marketing professionals, I think we're always looking at creative ways to, you know, market to a specific audience or have a specific angle. I think especially within an industry like ours, it's still relatively small. It's, um, you know, there's a lot of noise and especially with something like COVID, I feel like everyone is talking about the same things, right? So I think, you know, for us, for me specifically, the challenge has always been, how do we cut through the noise? Um, and it certainly helps when you have a team, you know, that's backing you up uh, at a line that's kind of feeding you stories, great news. And, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, that makes my job very easy, um, you know, but, but that's not always gonna be the case. I think one thing that um, one challenge more on the business side of things that I don't think you hear being talked about a lot on the marketing front is actually staffing. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about it being an operational challenge, you know, having and finding a lot of technical staff right now is is proving to be a challenge. I think as marketers, that's that's ultimately going to hit us, too. Um, you know, our, our marketing, it has to be niche, right? Just like operations, maybe not as technical, but people still have to have, you know, a, a, a pretty, they have to be well-versed, I guess, in, in the industry um, and have a certain level of, of technical acumen to do our job. So um, I think we definitely have to start looking at staffing for marketing in this industry as well. And, you know, I think it's our responsibility as an industry, especially as communications professionals, to you know, start introducing the industry to new audiences. Could not agree more. Not agree more. Great point, Joanna. 
Corey, what are you seeing uh, over in the channel side of the house? Yeah, well, I mean, your original question was like some of our biggest challenges. Um, right. And I do agree that with Joanna, um, to her previous point, not about staffing so much. I mean, yes, that's it. that's obviously um, something that we have to look into. Um, but, you know, marketing jobs are like white hot right now. Um, uh, and there's there's an abundance and everyone seems to be sort of jumping ship or changing at this point. Um, I think, I think fitting in to that new, those new lives that I was talking about, my new life, right? <laughs> my not always at my desk and constantly getting up and leaving and coming back, um, struggling to find and cutting through that white noise that Joanna was talking about, like that's imperative. And that's been the biggest challenge. How do you come out um, and and touch on all of your goals, not just ROI from a sales perspective, which of course is paramount, but from that thought leadership, from the brand awareness perspective, how am I getting my partners to think about right now, intermediate and call upon us? Um, I think, how am I creating not just content for content's sake, but how am I creating assets that are actionable or engaging. Um, you know, at TBI, I was lucky to have a really great video uh, video department and, a, and a, an amazing production manager who would put together like awesome, even parody videos about like the struggles of working from home. And it got people thinking and then, right, then they wanted to call us. I think cutting through the noise right now is the biggest challenge. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's actually a great transition to my next question. How are we measuring brand building and prospect engagement in this crazy new world? Are there tools, technologies? You mentioned video. I'm such a big fan of video, obviously. Um, so what, what's been helpful to you? Corey, I'll stay with you here. Yeah. Um, well, in an age where you're able to track everything, um, you know, do so. But also, you know, it's okay to put the onus back on sales. Right. I mean, that is why we have account executives. So um, everything is measured. Videos. We look at Google Analytics. We have social listening tools. Our PR firm does a great job at doing that. And then taking that data, absorbing it, and then passing those MQLs along to sales to convert. Um, I mean, it, it, it sounds simple, but at the same time, we need to put the onus on sales to act on what marketing has has worked so hard to produce and get people to engage with. And now we need to take it a step further. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And, uh, and it feels like sales uh, has been more and more on the, on the shoulders of marketers. I don't know if it's my perspective uh, dating me here, but I like how you're like, yeah, put the onus back on the sales team. I think that's. That's an interesting point. Glad you made it. Uh, <laughs> Eric, um, over at Backstell, what are you seeing? Any tools, technologies, best practices you want to share? Well, I mean, we we started using HubSpot, uh, which has great analytics, particularly from, you know, email, uh, you know, it integrates with CRM uh, and as well, um, you know, our website traffic. So we're able to do that. We're looking at um, integrating that with a, a broader uh, analytics platform. Um, so th that's to be D uh, and we're investigating that now. Um, you know, I think that, um, and maybe this brings up a broader question, but um, you know, it's very important to measure um, stuff, but also, you know, is some, you know, a portion of the, uh, of the marketing budget, should it be um, for brand building brand awareness? Um, you know, that, that might be harder to measure. Are there marketing, uh, efforts that might be harder to measure, uh, and, but are just known to be, as long as you're, you're, you're pointing it in the right direction, um, it might still be very beneficial for building your brand. Love that. Uh, I'll have a side conversation with you about some of the, <laughs> some of that mm -hmm. points later. I think there's, uh, so many things out there. Terry, what are you seeing, uh, over at Six Sense? Yes. Yeah, so, um, really related to what I talked about a minute ago, which is um, when you go, so first of all, I'd love to hear a couple of people talking about taking a more account-based approach because the biggest disconnect between marketing and sales is when marketing goes to the trouble of producing those great MQLs, but they're not in accounts that sales wants to sell to or can sell to, 
right? So the first most important thing that we have to do is make sure that as much of the product that marketing produces and delivers to sales is inside a set of accounts that you've mutually agreed. It shouldn't be just sales. Marketing has a lot of the intelligence about really where you ought to be selling. So, but it's gotta be a mutual agreement. And that's really the principle of ABM. Second thing is, if you focus more of your marketing attention on a specific set of accounts, you have to ask and then answer, how am I going to notice if it's working, right? And the way that you're going to notice if it's working is not by following one person who fills out a form through their life cycle. It's by noticing whether more than one person does, right? Your buyer in every case is not one person, but many people working together as a team. If that organization is going to buy something from you, multiple people from that team are going to end up on your website. A couple of them are going to fill out forms, maybe more. Much of that is going to end up as anonymous traffic. So what, what I was talking about a minute ago is bringing together those signals so that you can see, all right, is this one person who became an MQL, are they acting by themselves or do they bring friends? If they're by themselves, that company's not buying anything real soon, right? But if they brought friends, that's something you absolutely have to pay attention to. And I guarantee you that's in your data today. It's already there. You've already paid for it. The thing now is to make as good a use of it as possible. By the way, that's also great for customer experience. Today, most B2B organizations are kind of like that person who, if you can remember back when we went to shopping malls, would the salesperson who would stand in the doorway uh, of the store that you wanted to go into and you're like, okay, I'm not going in there because I don't want to have that person start harassing me the minute I walk into the door. All right, so we are that person. We start nurturing and calling folks the minute they come to our website. So they don't want to come to our website, right? Most of them are not in market right now. So if we can understand which ones are market and focus our attention on them, the rest of them will be over time a little less, a little less uh, concerned about coming to our website and filling out forms. They'll be more likely to understand that they'll be able to get the information they want when they need it. I love it. You're talking ABM plus intent data uh, measurement and. Uh... You know, and, and it's funny, we've, you know, we've seen a mixed, uh, mixed measurement now that everyone's working from home, you know, those reverse IP address lookups, they, they're getting some of their signals a little crossed, I feel like, uh, you know, what company are they truly from? Let's, let's kind of dig deeper there, unless they filled out a form and told us. Um, so is, is intent, I mean, we'll have this conversation later, I guess, but is intent data working? Uh so I'm going to jump in. I'm not going to pitch, but we do that really well. Uh, and there's there are ways to do that really well. It did, you know, so intent data did take a hit overall when people started working from home. Um, there was a substantial recovery because, you know, a substantial portion of people started working on VPNs. Um, and then there were also uh, sources of uh, intent that really don't rely just on reverse IP. Yes. Yeah. And I, I definitely think it, it's... Uh... It's the future. It just took a couple of little back steps uh, sure. the last last couple of months. Miss, I'm just going to do something, right? Um, John, how, what are you guys seeing? Well, I, I definitely think that attribution and analytics is going to be the largest challenge and the most interesting part of the marketing world to watch over the next couple of years. Uh, with with the demise of the cookie and really no clear consensus on what comes next. Uh, it, it, it's going to be, it's sort of anyone's game. And I think there, there, there will certainly be a greater emphasis on first party data. Um, it will be really interesting to watch how some of the larger tech platforms like CDPs adapt to this. How do the lookers and the mix panels and the, um, the companies like that adapt to this? Uh, it will, I think it, it will be more art and more art than it has been. I think I'll, marketers did themselves a huge disservice over the past five, 10 years saying that, oh, no, 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 it's, uh, it's all science now. There's no art. There's no, you know, spray and pray. Uh, I can tell you with 100% confidence where our leads are coming from and, and which ones are revenue attributable. Uh, it was never 100% science. We made progress in the cookie world, uh, but it was always art and science. And I think over the next, certainly over the next 12 months, if not longer, the amount of art required is gonna really start to rebalance 
Uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. It means that marketers, we bought ourselves another, at least another couple of years until we get replaced by AI. <laughs> Scary. All right, Joanna, uh, I just want to get you in on this, uh, this, uh, this conversation too. Uh, what are you seeing uh, tools, technologies, best practices that have been helpful? Yep. Uh, everything that everyone said, couldn't agree more, you know, making sure that you have a target and you're aligned with the sales team on your target list is key. Keeping a close eye on analytics, social engagement, all intent data is great. It's worked out really well for us. We do um, we do Zoom Info, use tools like Zoom Info for all of that intent data. One thing that um, that hasn't been mentioned that that I think the pandemic has really afforded us, you know, people aren't traveling as much. We're doing, you know, going back to Zoom, we're doing Zoom happy hours a lot more. We're getting some of that interaction in different ways. Um, which gives us a little bit more time and, and as people have said before, allows us to, to build a little bit of a deeper relationship, whether it's parrots flying at your screen or two-year-olds flying at your screen. Um, but, you know, it gave us an opportunity to get direct feedback from prospects and customers, you know, partners, coworkers, even some competitors, which has been very interesting, um, just, just because people have a little bit more time and you're able to build those deeper relationships. Couldn't agree more. Well said. Um, okay, one last question, and I know my team is probably like, "What?" Uh, but try to so quick, quick. We'll just quickly go around the the horn. But any final words of advice as we're planning for twenty twenty two? Anything creative that that you guys might be thinking about? Uh, what do we do with twenty twenty two? Joanna, let me continue with you. Sure. Let me let me get off mute here. I think this may seem counterintuitive, but you know, get creative in going back to the basics, right? Think about the basic things that people are lacking right now during a pandemic, working from home, and fill that void for them creatively. All right, John, any final words of advice? Anything creative to add? Well, definitely a plus one to what Joanna just said. And then uh, remember to have fun. You know, I, I think, uh, I think, all of us have, generally our stress levels have risen, our uncertainty has risen, and therefore our fun has fallen. Uh, it, it is so crucial to, to keep some element of, of fun and, and humanity in it. Here, here. Eric? Um, I would just echo, you know, building an analytics platform and, and John's point previous about art versus science that often we're, we're, we're but the pendulum swung so far in the science and, and measurability that there is some art there. Um, Love that. Uh, Carrie, final words of advice? Yeah, I think what uh, Joanna said was uh, really spot on. You have, everybody wants to have connection uh, and that's what's really been hurt during the pandemic. And so if you as an organization can create that connection uh, among your employees, among your customers, among your prospects even, um, and build that community and help build that community, I think could go a long way. And Corey, final, final words here. Very, very hard to go last. I mean, because I agree with everyone. Um, the art, mixture of art and science, I believe the last couple of years has done us no favors by saying we're all scientists, right? I do believe that COVID kind of leveled the playing field. Sales was used to certain ways of selling and you know, COVID kind of threw a wrench in that system. Um, but marketers, we were used to that. We're used to things ever evolving and changing Google, you know, changing algorithms every year um, as an example. So I agree. Um, I agree with everyone that uh, the connection, the human connection, you know, being forced to pick up a phone um, instead of clogging someone's email box um, goes a long way. Yeah, it does. Human connection. Well said, guys. Thank you so much. Guys, thanks. Uh, our speakers, their insights on marketing strategies post-pandemic. Fabulous, fabulous work. John Fucker, Prime Data Centers, Joanna CC, Aligned, Corey Cohen, Intermedia, Carrie Cunningham, Six Sense, and Eric Bell, Baxdell. Thank you guys so much. And hey, guys, just a quick reminder, our speakers are staying on for the remainder of this lunch hour. We've got 10 more minutes here. So go ahead and answer any more of, of uh, your questions. Go ahead and meet them back in that networking lounge and table hop. Talk to as many folks as you can. Also, viewers, if you were one of our first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch today. Make sure you visit us at jsa.net to register for more upcoming virtual roundtables.
Our next one, Thursday, October 21st, 1 p.m. East Coast time, where our leaders are talking about transforming connectivity, digital transformation, digital twins, just hinting at some, uh, some of our conversation here. Flip out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, you name it. Uh, in the meantime, see you back in the networking lounge. As always, stay safe and happy networking. Thank you.